Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. So what's happening in the restaurant business? What's happening in retail? 70% of the people in New York City have been vaccinated, also in New York State. So people are going to restaurants. People are signing leases. Landlords are doing different things. So today, with the help of my executive producer, James Famigliolo, we have this group of owners, lawyers, restaurateurs together to talk about a comeback of the restaurant business. My guest today includes Sean Lefkowitz, also known as Lefko. Uh, who is the principal of Davian Holdings, our attorney over here, Andreas Kudodakis, who is the managing partner of KI Legal and also the owner of Tribeca Kitchen. Our final restaurateur, a man who's been in the restaurant since he was a child at 19, probably working in a Greek diner somewhere originally, we have Stratus Morfogan, who is the owner, principal of so many restaurants that I can't even announce everything, but it's called the Brooklyn Chop House in the Brooklyn Dumpling Store. And then in addition, he's an author, he's a writer. So today we have a great group. And last but not least, the producer, James of Famariello, who is the president of Meridian Retail Leasing. So James, why did you bring these four, these three other people to the show today? What are they doing in the restaurant business besides paying a commission to you? Besides paying a commission, it's a well-rounded group, and they all seem to be optimistic about the future in New York City. Um, Sean Leskovitz is an investor, uh, and he feels bullish about the market. Uh, Stratus Morfogan feels bullish, and he did uh, all the way through the pandemic, and he took advantage of those situations by being uh, incredibly creative in structuring deals, and we'll get into that later. And Andreas can, can talk about his um, he's got two fronts. Uh, he's a, a lawyer by day and a restaurateur by night. And, and he feels incredibly bullish because he just renovated his entire restaurant and he's gearing up for a successful future. So Lefko, let's talk about what you did uh, with Stratus, I believe is your tenant. Yeah, Stratus is my tenant. Actually, Stratus and I were connected through the one and only James Famularo. Uh, so it's no wonder we're all here together. Um, we were connected because I bought a building last year, literally in the heart of COVID, um, on McDougal Street, 103, 105 McDougal Street, uh, which was a 72 unit building uh, with a massive ground floor retail space, uh, floor, block through retail space, um, used to be uh, Poncho's restaurant. Um, and listen, I took a chance in the middle of COVID. I made the deal back in June or July of last year. Um, it was amazing pricing. The, the key question was, how long would it take to lease out the space? For what rent? Um, can we make it work? I literally saw the space right next to NYU. I said, you know what? There's got to be one guy out there, one crazy guy out there 
um, who can see the vision, can see that, hey, you know, this goes all the way through Manetta Street. Um, you have double occupancy because of the, uh, the double exits in the front and the back. Um, you don't have it anywhere near NYU, and you'll take advantage of the foot traffic from NYU. Um, so I think within the first week or two, I hired James Bongolo. I know James is the king of restaurants. Um, he came highly recommended from the beautiful people, and James and I hit it off in two seconds. Um, he brought Stratus in within one or two weeks, and Stratus and I made the deal. Stratus saw the vision there. Um, he's almost up and running there in, uh, in McDougal, uh, probably a month or two away. And frankly, I think he's going to absolutely crush it over there, um, right next to NYU. With regard to that, it's a, it's a large restaurant. It's 14,000 square feet. 14,000 square feet is a lot of food you got to sell, a lot of liquor. So let's talk about the Brooklyn Chop House, which is, is like a combination going back to your father when he had the Chelsea Chop House, correct? Yeah, very good. Uh, my dad had the Chop Houses. I grew up on Chop Houses, but when I, um, oh, I've owned Chinese restaurants for the last 15 years, and at the same time, my wife and I would love to go to the traditional high-end steakhouses, but she only eats fish and vegetables. So she'd be there with a cream of spinach, baked potato, and a shrimp cocktail. And um, I, I, I really saw the opportunity of LSD, salt and pepper, ginger, lobster, that dry aged beautiful porterhouse by Pat LaFrida, 35 days, and, and marry that with Peking duck. To make a long story short on the menu, we combined those two cultures together. And I believe we created the ultimate surf and turf. And then we started it with pastrami dumplings and bacon cheeseburger dumplings. Again, mix and marry the two cultures. And that's how Brooklyn Shop House was created down in Fidei. Are you open or when are you planning to open? Well, with Sean, we're opening my grandfather's Greek restaurant. So my grandfather was the first Greek restaurant in New York in 1910. It was called Pappas. And he had it from 1910 to 1975. And after it closed, a lot of people hijacked the name Pappas. So together with Sean, we had some really great dinners and we discussed you know, I, I saw the Panchito's location and it's absolutely stunning. The bones of the location, the bones of the space was a perfect fit to bring my grandfather's restaurant back. And that restaurant will be called the Original Pappas. And yet, like Sean said, we're slated to open in the next couple of months. The foot traffic that we, we saw in the middle of the pandemic on McDougal Street. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it was exciting and also frightening. I mean, it was like, you know, when we, when we did the deal in 2020, um, you know, that area was still packed. I, and I think the only area in New York City, because you go to Times Square and there'd be no one there. But, but McDougal Street in Greenwich Village was like an open-ended flea market. It was packed. And, uh, and it was alarming. It was, it, it was exciting and alarming because this was very on early in the pandemic. And, and NYU was pretty much empty. It was just, you know, that street has just got a lot of energy. And even the pandemic couldn't crush it. Andreas, what happened you, you, to you? What, what, what have you been doing? I know you lost your dad last March to COVID. Um, but what, in your legal practice, what have you been doing so, with regard to the restaurant business? When I, when I graduated law school, it was the uh, first crisis that I experienced, uh, at least as a professional. 2008, market tanked. You know, top of my class, graduated early, all that good stuff. And it was everybody was getting fired. You had thousands of attorneys getting fired daily. And so it was a horrible market. And so the, the first thing that happens whenever the economy tanks is you see a lot of litigation happening. Right. So I have nothing to lose. I don't care how long I've known my employer. I'm filing an action and I'm moving back to my hometown wherever that is, whatever country that is, whatever state that is. And so I walked into work then in 2009 with my uncle's, you know, U.S. Department of Labor wage and hour audit. And that was really the beginning of a, a major, major change in, in the types of cases that are filed against restaurants. It's now the number one most filed case in both federal courts, Southern District of New York and Eastern District, just to show you the, the just sheer volume of those types of cases. So it started out as that, and ultimately there was more and more things that happened. So fast forward to today, you have another major crisis, and instantly you see a major uptick in these cases, especially with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, plaintiff's lawyers knowing that you have a lot of businesses that are getting you know, a massive check potentially, um, and they're just filing actions left and right. So 
you know, that's what I saw. Again, my father died last year. I'm in a unique situation. I built a law firm around representing restaurants, just full service, you know, mini big firm, if you will. And, you know, now here I am, I'm representing a, a ton of restaurants. My dad dies. I'm an only child. I have to take over the business. Not only am I representing them, I'm living in their shoes, literally, uh, kind of like the ultimate case study, if you will. So, you know, I didn't, uh, I just went all in. And the reason why I went all in is New York is really, really, really special. There's a reason why this was the one industry that the state, the federal, the city government just shut it down. They didn't shut down cleaners. They didn't shut down delis. They shut down restaurants because one industry, one, one consolidated group on off the people that travel here for tourism reasons, for vacation, they're gone. They're not coming. The people who say I'm moving from my beautiful hometown in middle America, nice, peace and quiet to come to this bustling city. They're not coming. They don't want to work here. They don't want to live here. And the, People that live here don't want to stay here because it's boring now. There's nothing to do. And they all left. So on off switch, you shut down this industry. They're all gone. And that was the basis of really going after this industry. That's a much longer conversation. But for that same reason, that is why this industry will always be great because it is a magnet. It is the reason why this city is so special. It is the reason why you have so many creative professionals in this industry here. It's because you have the world potentially coming into your business and you can do things like the Brooklyn Chop House and you can do innovative, creative things because there's so many, so much diversity where you can really test with certainty. It's almost the, the ultimate survey pool, right? Um, so this place, this city will always do great. My dad doubled down in 9-11. Everybody ran for the hills. He took over the next two stores that gave him up. All restaurants, diners, so many left. But he doubled down. I'm not doing anything for the next nine months. I might as well expand and renovate. It's crazy, but he did it. And he stayed around and he did well. Ultimately, here we are, Tribeca's Kitchen now, next door. Because he was there. Neighborhood was dead. But he invested and the neighborhood exploded over the next 10 years after 9-11. Uh, Stratus, have you been able to get money from the Restaurant Revitalization Act that came out in March? No, so what happened early on at Brooklyn Shop House, we had a $12 million a year business and we went down to about a million. Uh, we started donating product and we started donating over 8,400 meals to 16 hospitals, three police departments and a nursing home on Mother's Day. And that was really our mission from March, 2020 to June, 2020. And that really felt good. And that gave us a purpose during these devastating times. Um, with that said, uh, we got about 400 grand uh, in May, and that's when I started hiring my whole team back. And my landlord was really great at the time. It's still, you know, still great, but he really worked with us. And like I said, when you go from 12 million to 1 million, uh, you know, you know it, it, that's like a death, death kneel. But when we got, the, we got the money and we expanded to 100 seats outside, we had a very strong summer uh, when, when they opened up the summer uh, in uh, July 2020. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we survived. And, and I got to tell you, the highlight of my of my career will be donating to all our healthcare heroes. James, where, where do you see the market today? Are restaurants continuing to sign new leases? So today is a pivotal day. I think New York just reached the seventy percent mark of full fully vaccinated people. You know that was a, a, always a benchmark because that um, I think begins the process of, of herd immunity. Um, now, because we're crossing this threshold, all the res restrictions are being removed. So we're finally fully open and, and we've been seeing an increase, a steady increase. Uh, I think this year we're on track to sign 260 leases. So, um, and it's beyond our expectations or projections. So we, we just see great things in the future. I, I agree with everything Andrea said, as Travis said, uh, about the, the future being prosperous and, and New York City is something special about Manhattan specifically, but all of New York. Um, and it's just getting better and better and better. Let's go, when you sign the lease with Stratus, how do you bank take it? Because banks have not been always overjoyed with restaurants, especially during pandemics and other conditions. 
Now the requirements is anybody with a pulse. I mean, first of all, I think the narrative <laughs> has completely shifted right now. I'm very optimistic and bullish with where this market is going. Um, frankly, none of my retail tenants right now, I'm giving them any concessions. I had to make concessions back six months ago or 12 months ago. But right now I have restaurants that are booming. I have a restaurant at Cafe Select in Lafayette Street, it's a pretty famous restaurant. You know, I have to give him six months of concession. Uh, right now, I think he's doing better than he was doing before, pre-COVID. He has outdoor uh, seating outside. I think that there's just an optimism right now. And there's just um, a sense of uh, wanting, to, wanting to be in New York right now. There's all these young, you know, young students, young professionals, singles that have been locked up for a year, two years. And right now, they're just coming out with a vengeance. I mean, I'm seeing it even on my rentals. You know, forget the, the restaurants and rentals right now. You know, I'll give you one example. Uh, McDougal Street, I was projecting $3,300 for these one bedrooms. I'm getting $3,900 right now for the same one bedroom apartment. People just want to be in Manhattan. And when they want to be in Manhattan, that means that uh, the neighborhood uh, retail spaces, they should all be thriving. So I agree with Andreas. I think Times Square might take a little bit longer to recover because I think there's a lot of tourists that don't want to be in New York right now. I think crime is really a big issue right now that we need to hone in on. But when you're talking about the local submarkets, you're talking about here at NYU, you're talking about Cobble Hill, you know, parts of Brooklyn right now are absolutely thriving. Like they're doing really well. Okay. Um, when it came to yeah, when it came to the uh, the lease with Stratus, um, I mean, I actually closed in that building with a bridge loan, but uh, we're in the middle of a refinance right now. And you know, listen, they love Stratus' business plan. I showed them exactly what he was doing and and how long it would take for him to get there. Um, they know who Stratus is. He's got a, a recognizable name in the industry. Um, and they're all in on it, as are we. So I fully believe in the business plan. I think he's okay. going to doing a dumping shop right now. The banks, they love the business plan, right? So this is, for me, as looking at the clients, I said, they always complain they never have time to get in compliance to make the changes. Well, you had a lot of time in this past year. And businesses that took the time to clean house are going to come back. And the banks will love them. We represent a bunch of banks. They will give loans. Because if you have a business plan as an independent restaurant, guess what? You're the exception. Most don't. They just run into it. And this past year, you had a lot of time to prepare all of your things and get your house in order. And that's what you should have been doing. So, you know, that's who will survive and come out of this. If you did nothing but just complain and wait for someone to turn the lights on whenever that happened, well, you're not the person who's going to survive. You always need to be innovating. You always need to be improving in this city. You know, Lefko brings up, brought up Times Square. I, I want to bring up Times Square because James and Stratus talk about the lease that you did recently on Times Square, the other, the Buffalo Wild Wing, which you're changing to a Brooklyn Chop House, correct? Um, I'm actually extremely bullish on Times Square. I think the fourth, fourth quarter, I've been saying it since May 2020 on my Instagram. I've been saying that September 21 is the start of the Roaring Twenties. And I do believe very strongly that this fourth quarter in Times Square is going to be bigger than we've ever seen. And I do believe when it comes closer to New Year's, I don't believe there'll be a table reservation, an airline ticket or a hotel room available. I think it'll be like third world war is over and we were victorious and it's going to be a massive celebration. Uh, just last Thursday, I went to uh, a bar for the first time in over a year and a half and it was packed and it felt really good to actually see the cathedral, uh, you know, Mark Packer's uh, spot. It was packed and it felt so good to be back. I just think that's gonna be tenfold in Times Square. And when James brought me the deal from the Friedland property, so I was really happy that they were the landlords. Uh, they wanted Brooklyn Chop House and the Buffalo Wild Wings. And they were amazing because, you know, those deals are not meant for small guys like me. They're meant for, you know, public companies. They're meant for, you know, companies that can guarantee millions and millions of dollars in leasing. And they gave us a couple of months good guy clause. They gave us TIA and they gave us a $15 million build out that was basically five years old. And we actually can use about 13 million of it. And that was, um, that was a big score. And I just think Times Square is going to be on fire this fourth quarter for the next nine years. As my friend Shelly Fireman said, and then I'll let James, he, he took a number of years to go to Times Square, but he loves Times Square and he's going to love it again that it's reopening. And I think the only problem that we have in Times Square and we have in certain parts of the city is the safety question. I think the crime will diminish you know, quickly when people start coming back. A friend of mine just said to me that lives by the building in, in, uh, in Fondi, he says, I'm grateful that you guys are open. I'm grateful that you have outdoor seating. 
because when my 15 year old, uh, my daughter walks by, I know she's safe. And I think that's really what it's about. Is that when you allow everybody to have a mask on and go into a bank with a piece of paper and get a withdrawal of cash, I mean, anyone that has a bad intention with a mask on, it just exacerbates the whole climate that we're in. And I think that's all going to stop in the next three months. So, so just to be clear, when Stratus said that he, he got $15 million worth of build out, he didn't get the check for $15 million. He inherited $15 million worth of a build out. And just to give you a, a, a sense of the Who, scale who, of the who project, took the Jumbotron? Uh, Stratus has got in charge of the Jumbotron. Um, so just to give you an idea of the scale of the project, it's about 25,000 square feet. Uh, Stratus, the, the PA is for approximately 600 people, correct? Yeah, it's 600 people. And Michael, for your birthday, I'm going to put a, put a big happy birthday on the Jumbo chart for you this year. <laughs> he, he's got a roof deck. He's got a patio on the back. He's got a special VIP section, double high ceilings on the ground floor with a mezzanine surrounding it. I mean, it is an amazing space. And the previous Hi. tenants did an amazing build out, including an elevator and, you know, everything is so beautiful. And Stratus is gonna take it the rest of the way and, and build a beautiful chop house there. And I agree with Stratus. I think he's gonna have a waiting list a month long. Stratus giving a little more credit on the Brooklyn uh, dumpling and the automat. Tell us a little bit about that because that's an innovation in, in restaurant business. Uh, thanks. So I was a big fan of Horn and Harder. I, I went there when I was 10 years old with my dad and I always had it in the back of my mind as the most cost effective, efficient way to distribute a product. So I realized when the dumplings became so big at Brooklyn Chop House, I actually wanted to do a one and a half ounce sandwich shop. And that to me is a dumpling. It's a one and a half ounce sandwich. And so I, I started creating things like pastrami, bacon cheeseburger, the Reuben, the lamb gyro, uh, uh, even peanut butter and jelly. And they became really big at Brooklyn Chop House. And then from there, we pivoted to Brooklyn Dumpling Shop. And with Brooklyn Dumpling Shop, I, I reimagined the automat. I partnered with Panasonic. And uh, this was actually six months before COVID. I did it for just economic and efficiency reasons, not for safety. And, I, uh, and the goal is to bring the industry normal payroll uh, which is around 25 to 30 percent down to 15 and this way we're going to save jobs people say what do you mean save jobs you're actually taking jobs away i say no seven out of ten restaurants fail within the first three years number one reason is excessive payroll if we could turn around and get payroll from 30 percent to 15 percent i believe seven out of ten restaurants will not just succeed they will thrive and this way we'll be saving jobs we are the first restaurant that has sold over 139 franchises before we even open store one. We have 60 in development just in the tri-state area alone. Wow. Now, what size footage do you need? Connecticut at Yukon. Uh, we, have, we have all the college towns opening up in September. They range from 400 square feet to 1,000 square feet. And we've done about 20 deals like that in the tri-state area where the landlord basically put up the TIA for it. So since we have the landlord over here, Lefko, are you going to put up uh, any money for the Brooklyn Dumpling? I'd be happy to. In fact, I'm looking to buy buildings with Stratus as my tenant there. Yeah, we're, uh, we're looking at a couple of places in Brooklyn right now. So sure, I'd back them. Andreas, are you seeing young restaurateurs, chefs, looking to open up more restaurants today? I do. I think this is the this past year was the perfect time for you know the next generation, the son, the daughter to take over, right? The, the dads, the moms, they didn't really know what to do with this. You know, I remember talking to my dad the week before he passed, and and he would say, "I really don't know what to say with this one. This one is different. This thing is different. You know, I don't know how this is going to play out." And my dad was definitely ahead of the curve. You know, came here 14, but he was doing Excel spreadsheets. You know, before he passed. He didn't have education. So, but still, how do you hand that over? It's very difficult and you have a very resistant, you know, first generation. So at a moment like this, it's really like a perfect opportunity for the next generation to say, okay, let's reset everything. Let's see what we can do to come out of this. We're not doing anything. It's a perfect moment 
where the customer is not going to be confused why you made changes. They're not going to say what you were doing wasn't working and that's why you changed. It was, we're not doing anything. And so now I'm restarting and here is the new version and here is the compliant version and here's the innovative version. And now I've handed it over to my son to take it over or my daughter to take it over for the next 30 years. So I absolutely think that anyone who stays in this business in New York better turn up the game because there's a lot of really smart, compliant, legitimate operators that are taking over or coming in. And if you're not, there's no way you can survive. This is a business and you better be on, on the top of your game. With one minute left, James, what other retailers are coming into the market today? What are you seeing? So we're seeing a lot of ghost kitchens uh, more than ever before. We're seeing hybrid concepts where they mix two different uses, like a coffee shop, florist, uh, you know, different, different types. Uh, but mostly of all the categories, more restaurants, more bars, more cafes, because so many closed during the pandemic, everybody's looking to reopen and, and this seems to be a rush to, to open with this okay. new legislation that the SLA is trying to pass. It is great that our executive producer, James, brought his friends and we learned a little bit more about what's happening in the restaurant business. I'd like to thank Sean, AKA Lefko, Andreas, Stratus, and James, and I'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us, Mike.